Well, thank you for, uh, for making it to this last session of the day. <laughs> I'll try not to keep you too long. Um, so my name is Robert Summers. I work for, I'm a junior developer with Arma Cooney, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about um, my journey as someone new to software development and kind of the processes and tools that, that we use that I thought really enabled me to kind of really get stuck in and, and kind of start to learn my profession as a developer. Uh, the idea for this talk came about as um, I was speaking to some friends of mine, and we all kind of started our careers as developers around the same time. And I noticed there was a, a pretty big difference between my experience, my first few months on the job, and their experience. And um, probably the biggest difference was that I was coding every day and pushing features every day and, and working with the client every day, and they weren't. Um, so. Just to rewind a little bit, you might have noticed in the job title it says junior. And you probably don't see too many uh, junior developers here at the Cloud Foundry Summit giving a talk. But, uh, so let me just give you a little bit of background about myself uh, and how I got to this place. Uh, so I used to work in insurance. I worked in insurance for well over 10 years. Um, and towards the end of my time in insurance, I, I wasn't happy with what I did. And I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to do something else, something more fulfilling. Uh, something that I was actually interested in doing. And, um, uh, you know, th through a process I'll, I'll happily explain to you in the pub later, I, I eventually decided I want to, want to become a developer. And then I started to look at ways, what, what's, what are good different ways that I can kind of move from not ever coding before to becoming a developer. And eventually I decided on uh, joining a coding boot camp. Um, so I, I, I chose one in London called uh, Makers Academy. And they run a 12-week intensive boot camp where uh, you spend eight hours a day for 12, uh, five days a week 12, for 12 weeks uh, working on coding challenges, but all the while um, kind of progressing on the skills that you learn every week and building more and more and more complex projects. To, to mention in the end, everyone uh, works in a team building a final project. But anyway, at the end of this process, and I started to look for a job and. Uh, after going through uh, several interviews and different tech tests, I finally got my, my first uh, job as a professional developer in November of last year at Arma Cooney. And so what did my experience like, look like versus my friends? So uh, as we, after the first few months of working together, we kind of got together and we were kind of sharing our experiences. And um, I just started to get this picture of what their workplace must look like. <laughs> and, and this is how I kind of imagined they were, they were working, right? Like they were doing things maybe in old-fashioned ways. So what are some of their stories? Uh, like, you know, several of them had to go through long periods of training. Like even though we, they had gone through uh, an intensive boot camp and gone through the hiring process, so at some level they were trusted by the company they were joining, and they still had to go through another training process, sometimes over a month or two, and that was even before then they get into whatever they, the processes that they had to integrate within their own teams onto their own client projects. Um, the others just like, the, they're, they couldn't show up every day and just start to get stuck in coding, right? They had to, uh, they had to wait till they had uh, a senior member of the team available who can sit with them and make sure they were doing things that was kind of the proper way for their project or their style of coding. And often this was, um, gated by a code review. So I had one friend, like, they would show up to work every day, and like, they would have a task for maybe t a week, and they would work on one task for the week. At the end of the week, they would get their, their meeting with the uh, senior dev, and they would look over the code. And maybe it would go into production, maybe it wouldn't, and they would go back and then go through the process of refactoring, and this would just kind of go over and over again. And this just kind of created a long cycle time for them between, you know, seeing what they were doing versus uh, you know the effect that they were having on on the product, on the you know on the on the product that they were working on, um, and it just got made me think. So what what was I doing that was different? So that must mean if they were doing things the old way, I must be working in some really cutting edge futuristic uh, company, right? So what were we doing that was different? So my initial onboarding was about two weeks long. Most of that was focused on learning some of the new technologies that I would need to get exposed to as part of the client projects, such as Cloud Foundry and you know, 
coming from a boot camp, things like pipelines and Docker containers and uh, databases that aren't Postgres, uh, technologies that aren't Ruby on Rails, uh, had to kind of start to become really familiar with all of this. Um, and after that two weeks, then started immediately working, on, working in a team, working on a client project, and delivering code every single day. And so comparing these two experiences, I just started, I really wanted to ask this, you know, answer this question, you know, what, what does it take to get a boot camp grad, or anyone, not just specifically a boot camp grad, but any, anyone kind of new to, the, to software development, how do you get them into, integrated into a team and start, start getting them productive as soon as possible? Um, I think I lost the slide. Uh, <laughs> the answer, and part of this, um, part of the process to get these, uh, you know, a, a junior developer productive, I thought there, there are kind of several things in the way. Um, so this, this picture here, if, if you live in the UK, it's a very familiar picture, a little bit controversial. I mean, it, it, it's supposed to mean uh, there's road work ahead, so beware, right? But many people look at it and say, oh, it's a person who's dropped their umbrella. Um, but anyway, so what, what are some of these roadblocks that, uh, that you encounter as a junior dev to, to, to getting productive? And one is this long training time, right? Because, I mean, there's no possible way anyone that starts their job understands all of the technologies that you need to use in order to be productive. So not just the, the language that you code in, but maybe the frameworks that you use in that language have another learning curve, and then perhaps you're using a different database technology, you're using things like uh, in your operations environment, like maybe Docker, uh, pipeline technology. And if you're lucky, like myself, you're also deploying the app, so you've got to learn things like Cloud Foundry. There's lots, lots of things you need to learn, right? Um, the other is that they're not empowered. So like, I guess what I mean by that is that you know, as a junior developer, you don't just show up to work on day one and, and get access to the code base, right, and start pushing the code. And, there's lots of, uh, lots of processes you have to go through to complete. You want to make sure that your code, uh, vet, vet that you understand the, the project, make sure that you, you know all the HR processes and a lot, lots of things like that. And then finally, like, part of what kind of drives this kind of lack of empowerment and, and kind of the, the, slow, the slow burn of getting a junior developer productive is the fear of breaking things. So like maybe the other, the senior members on the team, they're afraid if we just give someone kind of at free reign to, to deploy and push code, surely it's just going to start to break things down the road, right? And to be fair, from the junior developer's perspective, we're thinking, uh, I don't want to be the guy that breaks the app. I don't want to be the, the guy that crashes the server and causes all, all the problems, right? So what do we do about this? So obviously, I think the, the title of my talk kind of gave this way of what, what I'm going to talk about here. So. Um, Cloud Foundry and Continuous Delivery, how this kind of helps create an environment where junior, uh, junior developers can become productive as soon as possible. So how do we get there? So first, talk a little bit about the process um, and the environment that we're going to create. And this includes um, ag uh, working in an Agile team. And what I mean by all these goodies that come with Agile. So part of, part of Agile development is you're, it's a very iterative process, right? You're, you plan, you're deploying, you get feedback, and then you kind of keep loop, you reprioritize based on that feedback and redevelop, and you're constantly going over and over in this cycle again, right? And that's very beneficial as a, as a junior developer because that iteration really reinforces the learning you're doing. So the more, the more, the more you're getting stuck in with the code, the more challenges that you're encountering, the more times you're having to think through different designs and different uh, different applications of what you need to do with the, with the client product, and the more you're going to learn about it. And also, one of, the, one of the benefits of the Agile process is that in an, in an Agile team, you're working very closely with the client or the product owner, right? So you're constantly getting feedback, and this constant feedback um, really helps kind of build your confidence, because it allows, you know, as, as a junior, you're kind of you're no longer in the ivory tower of your school anymore, right? You've got you're working every day, you're pushing code. And not you're not pushing code, but you're putting it in front of the client and they're gonna say, hey, this feature's good, well done, or nope, this isn't quite how we want it. We need you to kind of rework this or rework that. And you're it really helps give you confidence that you are actively contributing as part of the process 
and not just being dictated, oh, do this feature, oh, do that feature, right? And a very important part of, of the Agile teams is pair programming. Um, is everyone familiar with pair programming? Does anyone actually use pair programming in their, in their day jobs? Not, not as many as I thought. I'm surprised. Um, pair programming is an excellent way to get junior, dev, junior developers kind of on board with your technology, right? Um, you, could spend, you, know, you could spend weeks and weeks going through documentations, building sample apps, or you can sit down with an expert or a senior member of your team who is familiar, right? And know that, and learn directly and getting hands-on experience while still actively working on your project. Um, there are lots of other benefits of pair programming. And I think because I mentioned pair programming, it's you're kind of obligated to show a picture of yourself or your team pair programming. So for those that don't do it, um, the typical setup that we follow for pair programming is you have two people, right? Your pair, one computer but each person has their own screen, their own keyboard, their own mouse, and they're able to collaborate all day long in that setup without kind of invading each other's space. Um, and then finally, another really important, I think, part of the process for, for junior developers is a test-first mentality, otherwise known as test-driven development. Um, I know sometimes you can kind of start a holy war in places by, by advocating for TDD, and I, I think if you'll actually, if you'll just indulge me for a little bit, we, if we can at least agree that tests are important and that you do need tests for your code. And why, why is test TDD uh, good for junior developers? Because it, it helps focus your mind when you're, when you're writing code. Think very specifically about the requirements of what you need to do. And and the more code you write, the more tests you write, the more confidence you get in what you're doing isn't upsetting the balance of the code you've already written, right? Because we have all of our tests. But just because we write the tests, right, doesn't mean that everything, everything that we push uh, is automatically test right, because we, now we have, to, we have to start thinking about automation. So if we kind of go back to these roadblocks, so how, do, how do we overcome some of those roadblocks I, I mentioned before? So other, other than the guy dropping his uh, umbrella, um, so we talk about long training time. So a lot of what, a lot of what I've talked about already, the agile, um, the agile environment, test-driven development, and pair programming, they kind of help, help solve this problem, right? And all, all the rest of the things I'm about to mention, they all kind of synergize as well and kind of contribute to the development of the junior, junior developer. Um, so in the agile environment, using test-driven development, we're we're working on the code and we're delivering features, right? But I haven't yet talked about that in this team, we're not only delivering the code and writing the features in the app, but we're also deploying the app. And I think from my experience talking to kind of senior developers, people really experienced in the industry, that this used to be kind of two different worlds, right? You would have a, a, a development team and an operations team, and one would be kind of specifically responsible for one aspect, another the other. So how do we get junior developers uh, not only writing the code and delivering features on the app, but also deploying it? And the answer, of course, is Cloud Foundry. And why do we love Cloud Foundry? So many, you know, just listening to some of the other talks say, especially in some of the keynotes, it, it's clear that one of the major, one of the major features of Cloud Foundry is just that as a developer, it's just so easy to use. And Cloud Foundry does so much of the work for us that you know, we can spend most of our time writing the code in our apps and then less of the time having to worry about deployment and configuring deployment and manually doing all the deployments, right? And um, so, yeah, so, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> so just moving on. So how do we how do we overcome uh, the not empowered? So if if you recall, this is us talking about some of my friends where their their process and their teams everything was kind of gated by a um, gated by a code review. So anytime they pushed code, it was to a feature branch or to something, and they had to then wait for the review. And it might not just be for the the process for the junior developers. It might be the process for the whole team. This is how they do things. 
And of course, to get over this, we can talk about continuous delivery. Does anyone use continuous delivery in their, in their work environment? Oh, good, good. <laughs> Sometimes, I'm not, I wasn't sure if today if I was going to be preaching to the choir or maybe introducing kind of ideas that, that uh, would be new for your teams. Um, <clears throat> but one, one of the key kind of tenets of continuous delivery is that we're always delivering kind of production-ready code in small chunks and kind of rapid iterations. Um, and kind of going back to what we talked about before with Agile, Agile is a very iterative process. We're constantly delivering. We want to constantly be de delivering features to the client. And continuous delivery is, is, a, is a process that helps us implement that so that whenever we push the code, right, it's going right to the customer, right to the client. And <clears throat> again, as a, as a junior developer, being able to get that, that response, immediate response from the client about what you're doing uh, kind of helps give you that confidence boost. And then, of course, more confident developers, more productive developers, more independent, right? But another major, uh, one, of the more, one of the important parts of continuous delivery is that you need a pipeline. And how in the world can you get, um, can you, can you do continuously deliver the code from your desktop to the production environment without a pipeline? <clears throat> So what does a pipeline do for us? A pipeline, for those of you who don't know, pipelines will, they will automate all of the steps in our process from when we push the code to our, our repository to when it gets deployed into production. And this kind of helps, this helps, this automation helps us solve this kind of fear of, of breaking things, right? So if we were following our test-driven development, if we write, if our code has adequate test coverage and and we've been disciplined about keeping, keeping the testing uh, in our repos, and <clears throat> that we've got the proper coverage in our test period, and we know, we know that when, when we push code, that if something gone wrong, it will break before. Um, it will let us know by the test failing. So what do we use for our pipeline? We, we like Concourse. And why do we like Concourse? Concourse is very easy to learn. It's... Um, and one of the advantages of it, as from a developer's perspective, is that uh, is that everything you can, everything you do in Concourse can be delivered as code, and this helps us deliver value to the client, right? So when we <clears throat> when we build our pipelines and we use, we can check it into a repository, and then we then when we have a when we deliver it as code, then then we have a very clear history of of who's done what and what changes have been made. And so even if the same team is no longer working on the product, right, then all of the configuration for our deployment, which will be stored in our pipeline, that is then delivered as code to the client, which then adds value to the client, right? And it also um, adds value to the junior developer because then we're now part of this whole cycle of the, of the um, of the application, you know, from development to our desktop to the deployment into the into the um, into the application on the cloud. So I've got here. <clears throat> this is a picture of the the pipeline for that first project that I was going on. And in case you, so with Concourse, it's very simple. Uh, kind of breaks down the pipeline into kind of two simple concepts. You have a resource and. It basically boils down to you have a resource and a job, right? So our resource is going to be things like our, our code and maybe things like Docker images or, um, or even deployments. And then, and then we have jobs, and these are the things that we want to do to our resources, right? So we want, to, we want to run our integration tests. We want to run our full test suite. We want to deploy it to a pre-production environment. We then want to run our end-to-end -end tests in our pre-production. And if all that passes, then we want, to, we want our code to then be deployed to production. And then we want to run some smoke tests on production and maybe a few, a few more tests on production just to make sure everything is great. Um, and it's also very visual, right? And that's very helpful when you're new. When you're just learning, you get, you get very bright red flashes when things go wrong. And you know you need to analyze it. Um, <clears throat> So where, so where do we go from there? So, 
so this whole process I've talked about, we've, we work in an agile team, we're pairing, ideally with where, Matt, where the juniors are pairing with senior developers, we're, um, we're practicing test-driven development, we're, de we're not only writing our code, but we're deploying it to Cloud Foundry, and we're deploying it using uh, automation tools, uh, an automation tool pipeline called uh, with uh, Concourse. And so what do we get from this? We learned that tests are really important. Not only do they help focus how you write your code, but they also give you the confidence that uh, as your product grows from you know, your Hello World API app to you know, the very complex microservices uh, application that your client has demanded, um, your tests kind of give you the confidence that uh, everything you're doing is keeping everything in order and you're not breaking. As a junior developer, the next thing you learn is that environment matters. So when you when you kind of when you're learning to code right, you're you're very used to just a, a single environment. You might have your or maybe two environments: your development environment on your laptop, and then when you deploy your code to something uh, to production. And when you start to work, when you work as a junior, and you're kind of responsible for the whole life cycle from coding the features to deployment, it really makes you it really introduces you to more concepts like how to, you know, cloud, you know, important cloud native concepts like, you know, keeping the configuration as code and how we keep our, our application as cloud native as possible so that it can run no matter that we're running, you know, we're pushing it on one cloud provider to the other. Um, and finally, you really get to learn the value of the short feedback loop. So that with part of the Agile process, because we're constantly getting feedback, not only from our client, but in stand-ups, we're learning about everything that our other, our other team members are doing. And this really helps give you, give you the uh, confidence. I keep saying that a lot. It gives, gives you lots of confidence to keep doing your job, right? And when you, when you see that you're, what you're doing is actually valuable contribution to the team. Uh, no longer are you, you, you feel like a junior or someone that has to kind of hide or maybe be shy about what you do, but you actually you know that you have something to contribute, and that's very valuable. So in summary, why, why do we love Cloud Foundry? So I realize this is a Cloud Foundry Summit, and I haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about all the, the massive features of Cloud Foundry, you know, but that's because, you know, Cloud Foundry in itself is so simple, simple to learn that you know juniors can learn it. And I think when I first gave this talk, I I made the very bold claim that uh, you know I if you have got an app, I can teach you how to deploy it in Cloud Foundry in the pub later. You know, <laughs> and it's it's really it's really that good. And that and because it's so powerful, it does so much for us. It allows us to focus all of our time on value-added tasks. Uh, like and the, and doing the things that we like, like solving the coding challenges, and um, delivering value to the client. And um, so, <clears throat> I hope that uh, I've given you an idea of about you know the kind of environment and the processes and the tools that you can use to kind of help your junior developers get productive really quickly. And. Um, you know, you never know. Maybe, maybe in a year from now, they, they might be at the next Cloud Foundry Summit, uh, giving another talk about about what they've done. Um, all right, thank you. So. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> when you said you did pair programming, so in our organizations, our team don't do pair programming yet. Yeah. Um, and you were a junior developer, and uh, so had, did you have your own assignment? And how did that work together with the senior? So could you only watch, or what, was he only watching, or, or the senior developer only yeah. watching? No, yeah, so <clears throat> in case you didn't hear, he's kind of asking, how, how do you, when you, um, when, when you start pair programming, you know, how as a junior do you work with the senior? And I think it's important when you start pair programming, you've got to kind of have a, maybe have a little chat with your partner how, how you want to organize your day. I think one of, the, one of the things I like to do is make sure we kind of schedule our breaks because pair programming is quite intensive because you're, 
you're, you're, set, you're constantly engaging with another person, but you're not just kind of having a social chat, right? You're working through complex problems on, on the, you know, whatever, whatever feature you're coding or developing. Um, so how do you deal with the, like the discrepancy between uh, junior and senior? So the, the, kinda, the most common, I think, pair programming pattern, right, is you have something called the driver and navigator. And um, the idea is that you know, the, the driver is on the keyboard and is kind of typing the code. And the navigator is trying to, to keep, keep the coding kind of focused on, on the problem at hand and trying not to get sidetracked. And, yeah. So how, how does that work in the kind of junior-senior relationship? I think as a senior, you probably have to uh, maybe take a step back and make sure that you're, not, you're just going to have to accept you're not going to be able to move at the same pace as maybe you could be if you paired with another senior. Um, but also that, you know, when... So if the, if the senior is navigating, it's probably going to be a lot of dictation about exactly, like, okay, this is the syntax, you need to start here, here's the method name, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the good thing about pair programming is you can actually reverse that role and... Um, you can have, you know, there's no, no reason why the, the junior can also be navigating. And whether that navigation is, you know, by uh, directly dictating, like, oh, you know, we need, you know, we need to consider, you know, this problem or, or that the, the data is coming from this source, but also can kind of challenge the senior, like, uh, I'm not sure what they can do. What, what's the right pattern to solve this problem? Or what, what's the right feature that we need to, to implement? Um, and so it's kind of a, it's a back and forth. And the more you do it, the more, the more the kind of the senior, I think the, the value to the senior is that, you know, when you, when you teach, you, uh, you kind of, you learn what you, you kind of relearn what you know, right? Because you have to re-explain it. And then, um, yeah, does that help? <laughs> uh, same question, but uh, in more, more practical way, uh, for example, uh, are you pushing code to the uh, Git repository and senior is checking the code and uh, is sitting, okay, this is not good, and uh, some writing comments, this is not okay, rewrite this uh, function because uh, it might fail, uh, uh, this test is not enough, write another one, or uh, right. how it works through the Git and uh, this iteration works through the Git or some uh, SVN or something like this? So you're talking about like just as in terms of pair programming or just in terms of like yeah, the project pair, team? Pair, pair programming. Okay. So how, how the senior is uh, reviewing the, your, your work uh, in a practical manner? I think um, just in, in the situations I've been, it's, it's just, it's a constant process. So like um, just the other week, uh, I had started a new project and it's in a, a, a language I've, I've never worked in. It's uh, a new project in Golang. And, I I just have to. I just have to warn. I like. I'm going to be asking you lots of questions, right? Uh, but as far as I'm sorry, what, what did you mean about checking in? Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. Uh, I mean, how you sending uh, to the uh, sending your work to the senior programmer to uh, check the the code if it's okay? So, are you pushing the code to the repository and he's uh, uh, looking through the some Git GitHub oh. or GitLab uh, web interface and uh, writing comments on your oh. on your uh, code, or uh, are you sitting next to each other and he's looking over your shoulder and uh, commenting <coughs> uh, what what's uh, what needs to be fixed or, yeah. or in this practical way. Okay, sorry. I see what you're saying. So how, how, when, you're, when the junior is pairing with the senior, how, how, is that, uh, how is the senior kind of reviewing the code? So in our case, it's kind of as you go. So as, as you're coding, the senior's, senior's providing, you know, the senior's providing feedback and, and advice on actually, this is the kind of pattern we want to use. Um, at first, it can be it can be a little tricky because you know when you're completely new, you know you have you have to be told all the basic things right, and but the more the more that happens, then the less you have to be told it, and then you know so maybe the second day of, of pairing, uh, things are start to pick up a little quicker because you then have the basic patterns involved, and you know part of our process we're always we're continuously delivering so the code is always being pushed 
to the master branch in the repository. Uh, so the seniors are viewing the code as we go. Um, I, do, I do think there is a place, though. Like We often put chores in our, on our tracker for code reviews. Like, you know, we, we've gone a while. We've delivered a lot of code. It would be really great if uh, someone could take a look at this, and you know, we can then go through refactoring if, you know, into something better. And that's, that's definitely a valuable exercise. Cool. Anything else?